Well, I, I remember I was taught by Patrick Blackett, who was in the Navy at the Battle of Jutland. And he noticed something rather interesting during the battle, which was that all the all the shells being fired. Well, I, I remember I was taught by Patrick Blackett, who was in the Navy at the Battle of Jutland. And he noticed something rather. Yeah, well, I heard myself in an echo there. Anyway, he figured out that it was because they were in the Southern Hemisphere. And the War Office did not know that the Coriolis Force changes sign at the equator. Yeah. They adjusted all the telemetry wrong. And yeah. the result that all the shells were missing the German battleships. And so according to legend, Patrick Blackett worked out the correction on the spot. And that's what <laughs> he was <laughs> really proud of that. <laughs> Hey, Jean Patrick, you were taught by some great scholars. <laughs> well, this fellow, <laughs> this fellow was rather interesting, it must be admitted. <laughs> yeah. Some of us have never seen these fellows, we just hear about them. Yes, that's right. Maybe they never occurred. Oh, hi, Tom. Hi. Hi, Tom. I was wondering what My music name's... was playing. <clears throat> oh, there's John Costello as well. Hello. Hello, how are you? Pretty good shape. Very good morning, John. Steve now. How are you? Hi, John. Good, yeah. Hello. Hi, and Larry Bird. It is. Yeah, Doesn't Larry everybody Bird. have a Larry Bird in their in their office? <laughs> <laughs> His birthday was a week ago, Pearl Harbor Day. It's a nice picture, there, Steve. It shows you it like you are in the clouds over the world. Yes. Oh, right. Uh -huh. mm. right. Yes, Steve, what are you aiming for? You're writing over Russia, but I think you're aiming at Siberia, I presume. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, uh, uh, I'm aiming at a, gul a particular gulag. I think, so, yes, yeah. <laughs> That's probably where you would have ended up if you'd stayed mm. in that part of the world. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I would have been the first resident. <laughs> That's right. But I don't you think they would have left it expensive. Right. <laughs> I would have had more yeah, like a shot. head is also in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. also in Canada. Yes. Ubiquity, that's what they call it. Mm -hmm. Steve. No, it's uh, it, it's Schrodinger's cat. It hasn't been decided yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, Steve is all over. Or on another, or think of it as a hybrid state. Well, the yeah, thing eight, is, eight, we, eight, eighty we years, open... and you're still waiting for your wave function to collapse somewhere. Absolutely. <laughs> if we if we open the box and we find you really there, what happens to the other side? <laughs> um, that's an excellent yeah. question. Einstein would have been very interested in the result of that, and so would Bohr. <laughs> so, Steve, what day is your official birthday? It was it was actually uh, day before yesterday? Oh, well, yeah. happy good. belated. And uh, my wife and son, particularly my son, my wife did a lot of the lead work, uh, Betty did a lot of the leg work, 
but Jonathan put it together. For some of you may know about this, a um, uh, a video of a little bit more than an hour of various people who um, I knew throughout my life uh, saying either nice or embarrassing things about me. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was started off by somebody who was my upstairs neighbor in the apartment house in Brooklyn where I grew up. Um, and he has probably known me but me essentially since I was born. He's about six years older than me. Um, and he had some interesting things to say about the very distant past. <laughs> uh, but it was amazing what was put together. And how are you coping with all this staying at home? Well, actually, I should say, how's Betty coping with all this? With you di staying with at difficulty. Home? <laughs> and the the only thing I can imagine being worse than cooped up, even with somebody you're fond of for now since March, that's nine months, um, is being alone. I can't imagine what it must be like to be, I mean, to live alone uh, under these circumstances. I mean, you get to, um, I mean, I hadn't realized how much just everyday encounter with people, going to the grocery store, getting lunch at the, uh, uh, a local lunch place by the university, I hadn't realized how much these things, how shall I put it, contribute to the fabric of life. And how, and how you miss them when they're gone. But basically, except for a few instances, I haven't been past my mailbox since March 12th. Now it's a nice mailbox. But still, <laughs> nice part of the world. <laughs> yeah, but do you still have your dogs? Absolutely, and cats. <laughs> I feel like a rancher. Well, actually, Steve, if you start fattening them up, they should start getting suspicious. Right. <laughs> well, Betty is fattening me up. I am suspicious. There is a place, a restaurant in town, a steak place that we go to for special occasions, or have gone to, we have it now. And so, for my birthday, Betty tried to re um, create uh, a typical meal that we might have had there and it was quite good <sighs> good morning Klaus good morning Steve so when is that birthday it was actually the day before yesterday Oh, well, happy birthday. It's my Thank wife, you. Teresa. You know Teresa, right? It's her birthday today. Of course today. I do. Yeah, it's her birthday today. Ah, yes. Well, uh, on this, us December birthdays stick together. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, she's working. Otherwise, she could say hi. But yeah. maybe tonight. We'll see. She's working this early? Uh, yeah, well, uh, she's in a school, you know. They, that school is not virtual completely yet, so we'll uh, see. Well, I am very happy that our school is completely virtual. Well, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not very happy about it, but uh, um, from the health point of view, I'm happy about it because uh. um, 
there's a word for teaching online. I mean, the, the adjective, well, it sucks. That's an industry yeah. term. Yeah. <laughs> I really don't like it. Students yeah. aren't crazy about it. Um, and I don't think the students learn as much. No, that's right. The students push for in, you know, online, uh, for, for in person. Sure. Yeah. Right. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So before they start, let me just tell you, I will have to sign off, you know, off of this session at least uh, at around five to ten. It turns out that I have another meeting that I can't move. Yeah. So, but I'll do my, I'll hang in here, and then I'll be back tonight anyway. For yeah, for us tonight, for them in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is crazy. This schedule is really crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Ah, okay, so this is a uh, Pranava. Okay, so I didn't yes. know. Uh -huh. I see yeah, hi. Daniel Rowe here. Hi. hi, Daniel. Hi. Hey. Hi, Steve. Hi, uh -huh. everyone. Hi. Hello. Hi, Fati. Hey, hi. I see you, Lana and Tom. You know, there we go. Yes. Okay. I, I'm not exactly sure. You know, this Zoom thing, it, it only allows me to see a few people, but uh, I see John. There is an arrow. At the yeah, bottom, yeah. you can uh, you can scroll. And go yeah. down and see uh, and see others as well. Oh, well, there's 35 participants. Yeah, so oh. yeah. So yeah, they wouldn't fit the screen anyhow. I see 26 now. 27. Ah, there's Chris Green. Look at that. Yeah. Hey, Chris. Good day, hey. Steve. Hey, everybody. Yes, we're Chris. Wow. Congratulations on the big event, Steve. Thank you. I decided that uh, in the aftermath, I'm going to go back to 60 and start over again. There's <laughs> <laughs> Bob DuPont as well. Hello. Yeah. Oh, I have not seen you for a long time. In the basement of Balin. But yeah, I guess I had one trip to your university. Yeah, colloquium, and that might be the last time. Well, and I actually, guess, yeah, Bob, I you asked the, Bob, you asked the question about when we met. I remember it was in you were a graduate student, and it was at a deep meeting. It was before deep was day mop. Oh, it was okay. And so I you can remember back. What years? What years were you a graduate student? Do you remember? I, uh, 70 through 75. Okay. It was the Chicago meeting in 1974, I believe. That wasn't the one where we really made the faux pas, right? No, 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 no. That was more than <laughs> four years that. Ago. <laughs> I need to hear more about this. <laughs> oh. Uh, actually, I looked i tried to find the um uh abstracts from that this was a case where steve and i worked on an abstract he gave it to his secretary said it looks good send it in and then later found out that the title wasn't attached and so it got introduced without a title steve and i were sharing a room we sat there and then we had this conversation across a crowded room of, I thought you were giving it. <laughs> um, both of us thought the other person was responsible. And I think we still think the other person was responsible. Um, <laughs> needless to say, at the coffee break, um, the word spread rapidly. Perhaps the, uh, we should use the opportunity of this meeting and you could sort it out between yourselves now. <laughs> no, we actually did. Uh, we got some slides, some things together, and the, we were able to make transparencies at the hotel at an exorbitant cost, and we gave it <laughs> later in the session. I think I gave it, as a matter of fact. You might have. Um, Steve, you have I think I hit. There. But uh, Don Madison was the chair of the session, and he never let us or anybody else forget it. <laughs> yeah. Tom, Let's just say. Is, oh, yeah. Yes. Tom, it is about time. Do you think we should be starting now? 
Yeah, you got to say a couple of words first. Yes. Uh, so, um, uh, good, good morning to good evening to good night to good morning back again <laughs> to everybody, uh, depending on the time zones. And um, as I speak to you, um, it is uh, past midnight in Australia, and morning in the US. So, you know, everybody is on a different time zone. And uh, it has not been possible for us to meet at one place because of the pandemic. But then uh, the internet is certainly enabling this conference. And it's a great privilege to welcome all of you on behalf of the organizers, which is the Center for Atomic, Molecular and Optical Sciences and Technology, which is a joint initiative of the Indian Institute of Technology, Tirupati, and also the Indian Institute of um, Science, Education and Research, Tirupati, and also Dayanand Sagar University, which is based in Bangalore. So it's a great honor and a privilege for me to welcome all of you to this conference. And the organizers will especially like to thank Professor John Costello, Professor Gorsica, Professor Anatoly Kaifetz, Professor Alfred Mezzani, M. Cezani, and Professor Kiyoshi Oeda for accepting our invitation to help us put this conference together. Uh, the conference itself has been commissioned by the great, excellent support mm -hmm. from Professor Satyanarana, who Steve certainly has met, and um, Professor Ganesh also from Isar Tirupati, and Professor K. N. B. Murthy, who is the Vice Chancellor of the Dayanand Sagar University. Mm -hmm. So, um, apart from listening to some very exciting talks which are coming up in the five sessions we shall have. Uh, we are also celebrating Steve's uh, contributions to the field of atomic molecular optical sciences for well over half a century. And Steve just celebrated his 80th birthday. So we all wish you very many happy returns of the day, Steve. Thank you. And uh, look forward to your insightful questions and clarifications. Uh, the meeting time uh, because we are all on different time zones in different parts of the country is going to be very tight. Uh, so I think we should jump straight into the conference and I will invite um, Professor Garcica of the Western Michigan University to chair the session. He's well known for his contributions to the understanding of fundamental interactions in atoms and ions and contributions in atmospheric sciences, plasma environments, astrophysics, um, so Tom, uh, please uh, take over. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Garcic. Thank you, Pranav. Uh, welcome to the first session uh, entitled Synchrotron Spectroscopy of Atoms and Molecules. There will be seven speakers, um, each allotted 20 minutes. 15 minutes for the presentation itself with a five minute question slash uh, transition of <laughs> peaceful transfer of power. Um, <laughs> didn't get away from it. So um, we'll try to finish. It's about 10.04 now. I'll keep track give every speaker a warning after 12 minutes, a three minute warning. And, uh, and so hopefully we'll be finished around 1230 Eastern time. I'll refer, begin with um, Bob Dubois from Missouri University of Science and Technology, given the talk collaborative studies of photon induced multiple ionization and electron emission resulting from dressed iron impact. Bob, are you sharing your presentation? Okay, just a second. Uh, I think it is there. And if I do that, 
Okay, does everybody see that? Yes. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Yes. Beautiful. Okay. Thank now God I you understand. realized you were giving this. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> okay. Uh, look, now I realize why I'm in this session. Uh, Tom, it's proton, not photon. Um, <laughs> okay. Okay, yeah. look. When th this is a little bit strange, uh, but when I put this together, Tom contacted me. I thought this was going to be a in-house uh, uh, small meeting for Steve. And so I picked a topic that wanted to show Steve's contributions that uh, certainly uh, meant uh, or had impact on the field and had a lot of impact for me. Now, um, uh, I guess I want to say for everybody, uh, at least my experience is, is I really enjoy working with Steve. Um, you know, he was fun to work with and we shared uh, hotel rooms at numerous meetings. He was fun to travel with. So uh, it was good. Um, from the initial title, which I think is on the abstract, I expanded it uh, to show how it, this, uh, these studies had potential impact on biomolecules. So um, the, when I was at the Pacific Northwest Labs, we were doing radio, uh, radiation damage to biological material. And for me, biological material were um, gas phase atoms and molecules. Uh, the standard thing in this field is you have track structure, where you have a primary particle going through, this is well known to uh, most physicists by now. Um, secondary electrons come out. You wanna know the probabilities of those coming out, where they go, their energies. Uh, they, at the damage sites, you wanna know where those are, what species are formed and probabilities and things like that. Uh, for the deep Bob, uh, can I yes, <clears throat> ask everyone not given the talk to mute your microphone so we're not picking up background sound? That was suggested by someone. Okay, and and actually in this case, since uh, right, it's pre-dawn here, since it's pre-dawn here, you may hear the garbage collector pull out in front of my house after a bit. Okay, um, for DNA damage. The main, uh, most of the damage is single strand breaks of the DNA, but the real damage you're interested in are double strand breaks. Okay, so I'll get back to this later. The, uh, let's say for radiation, if you have alpha particles, you have stopping power as they move through the matter. They change from doubly charged helium to a mixture of double and single charged to uh, ultimately a mixture where most of the particles are neutrals. So you would like to uh, know these tra track structure and damage uh, things for those types of species at a range of energies. Okay, now moving back. Oh, um, uh, one last thing on your damage mechanisms. Okay, as I said, single ionization, which I simulated in the upper left corner. You know, let, I just simply show a proton coming in, damaging the DNA, and the electron goes out and damages the other strand. That's a, a, just a simple picture. Uh, of the upper right, uh, I do like a double ionization of a water molecule surrounding the DNA where two electrons go out and they damage different sites. Uh, if you had projectile ionization, uh, if the projectile loses an electron, it turns out that then the outgoing projectile and the outgoing electron, um, which is uh, low energy in the frame of the projectile, they are temporally and spatially correlated, and so they could damage two sites. So those are just simple examples. So that's where double ionization and projectile ionization come in. So now we move back, uh, I guess not yet. So information you need is differential electron emission, multiple electron emission, and the channels, that tells you the amount and distribution of the deposited energy. You would like to know the, the product, target products, because that would tell you 
uh, or that would lead to direct or subsequent chemical processes or biological processes. And you would like these for barren dressed ions on biologically relevant molecules. Okay, um, so moving back to what Steve and I did, at the time, there was a lot of interest in direct multiple outer shell ionization. Okay, and if everybody goes back in their memory, remember the big discussion on single step mechanisms or multi-step mechanisms. The big difference was in single step uh, mechanisms, the multiple ionization over single ionization would be a constant with the impact energy. For uh, multiple ion or for a multi-step mechanism, you get a different ratio. Uh, and so what to test it, you really need direct outer shell multiple ionization information. Okay, now helium is easy. That's what most people studied because there's only an outer shell. For the other atoms, you need to separate. So this now goes into what Steve and I uh, worked on. So uh, one paper that we were especially proud of, uh, we were able to do all of the major contributing channels to uh, proton impact ionization of helium, neon, argon, krypton, and ultimately xenon. And here's just a couple examples. The left side simply shows um, the um, uh, different channels that contribute. That's all I'm really going to say about that. Uh, um, that. The left side is for single, double, and triple ionization of neon. The right side, I'm just showing triple and quadruple ionization of krypton. And uh, the far right panel, just to give you a correspondence of how important that is in, uh, for krypton, is I'm showing you the, uh, the blue curve is the single ion direct outer shell ionization probability. And the curves in there are for electron removal. Uh, inner shells play a role. Capture plays a role. Uh, if you're going to do track structure models, you need to know those quantities. That's where the relevance comes in. Um, and we were able to test the various outer shell mechanisms. Here, I just simply show regions for helium, neon, and argon, where we were able to say that this is a multi-step process or a single step process. Okay, now, to show where that's changed in the past, I don't know, decades, uh, these, this is an example of CDW EIS calculations uh, that it's sextuple ionization by electrons and protons uh, for krypton and xenon. And you're looking at, uh, for electron impact, as you get to low energies, there's deviations of experiment and theory, but you know, that's pretty darn good and far, far better than when Steve and I were doing the work. Okay, where does it, could it have relevance to biomolecules? Here's single and double ionization of uh, argon that Steve and I came up with, all the black curves. Overlaid with that is a Monte Carlo calculation that has been arbitrarily slid up and down and normalized for best agreement of guanine, one of the DNA bases. And what I would, uh, I guess the main point of this is, you know, a lot of similarities, even though we're talking about vastly different things. Okay, so, oh, the other uh, relevance is I mentioned that uh, you're interested in the damage. On each of the argon curves, I've put in how much energy is deposited at the site for this process to take place. And you can see that for inner shell ionization, the 
you know, uh, probability may be lower, uh, uh, but the uh, energy deposited can be far larger and the molecules going to uh, react to how much energy is in there. Okay, uh, let's see, I'm running over the time. So um, the other thing Steve and I looked at was uh, projectile ionization. The main thing out of this was uh, if you look at the figure and the red curve is just the differential electron emission and helium plus helium. Okay, what uh, I set up and did some uh, coincidence studies where we wanted to pull out the projectile ionization part. The part that was of interest. Okay, the part that was of interest was the upswing in the blue oval. And Steve showed that was a case of the, uh, uh, the projectile being ionized and the electron being excited. So that's, you know, that's where the other relevance is. That's a different mechanism. So uh, let's, uh, this is the final slide. The Main part about this is, okay, uh, at the time we were doing these, uh, at ICPEAK, you really couldn't bring any data on molecules past a triatomic there and anybody have interest. Now I look at the abstracts and I can't pronounce half of the things that people study. But what you're really interested in is differential electron emission, multiple electron emission, and the contributing channels because they tell you how much energy is deposited for barren dressed ions on biologically relevant uh, molecules. And you would also like to know the target products because that tells you about any uh, chemical processes that take place immediately after or sometime later due to this. So uh, the whole idea of this was try to, uh, well, let's say, show where work that uh, Steve, or uh, contributions that Steve made, uh, laid a bunch of groundwork for studies that weren't possible at that time, but are being done at the present time. So basically, Steve, I enjoyed working with you. Uh, after I moved to Missouri, there was, I was doing different things. There was less opportunity, but still got a lot of fond memories. And I think we both profited and hopefully the field did too. So thank you. Very nice. Thank you, Bob. Um, there's plenty of time for questions here. If anyone would like to, let me, oh, let me go to the chat now. Uh, the, um yeah, so do I undo share screen? Yeah. Yeah, you okay. can. Okay. Um, so All right. if you're, if you have co-host privilege, you can just, uh, well, you can unmute and then just ask a question if there is one. Can I ask? Uh, yeah, and let, let me simply say that because uh, of the type of talk there, I, if I don't get questions, we can use this for the transition period. So don't feel obligated. Yes. Can I, can I ask a question? Yes. Yeah, this is Lokesh here, Lokesh Tribedi. Hi, Robert. Hello. Okay, <laughs> yeah, hi, yeah. The question is, uh, you, I just, you mentioned about the guanine results. Results on guanine, right? Single and double ionization. Yes. In that, uh, in the data for argon, in that, right? So, what was your conclusions about the guanine results? I mean, did they compare well with some theoretical models or something? Well, okay, Th those were uh, Monte Car. I, I, I believe that was a Monte Carlo okay, calculation. Okay, so this is not they compared with the experimental data. Yes, okay. and and look, the reason for picking argon is uh, if I do a uh, effective Z for guanine or whatever, okay? okay. Um, it's, it's not argon, 
Okay, mm -hmm. I, in my opinion, and I use the thing that Rand Watson did for electron loss, where he did some effective molecular Z, uh, it would correspond more to neon. I simply chose the argon because the curves were so much more similar, um, just to give you the idea. Okay. So okay. That, that was why that comparison was made. And, and obviously the cross sections are uh, uh, for the guanine are, are uh, much larger. I simply slid them down for a visual agreement. Okay, okay, that is so, fine. I was wondering what happens to the double ionization to single ionization ratio. Does that uh, match with the trends for argon? Uh, actually, I thought of doing that, but I counted the number of slides and decided against it. And, and honestly, I did not look. And, um, okay. and, and I have to say that the, those Monte Carlo calculations were done for all four DNA bases. Hmm. And visually, they're all virtually the same. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else, or do we want to use the time to see if the next speaker can do it effectively? <laughs> well, let me say one thing. Um, from my point of view, the, uh, the beauty of this work is that it was an experimental and theoretical um, joint effort. And we got a lot more from it than we would have gotten from uh, either individually, in the sense that uh, in those days, we could not do a very good job of multiple ionization, but we could do a great job of inner shell ionization. And so like in neon, there was a question in those days, what was the mechanism for double ionization of neon? Was it a direct double ionization of the outer shell or was it a K shell electron knocked out followed by an OJ process? We nailed that down. We couldn't have done it well, we might have been able to do it experimentally, but it would have been very hard. But with the combination of experiment and theory, we were able to nail that down. And that pleased me very much. The fact that putting experiment and theory together, we were able to get out much more than simply the sum of the two. Yeah. And, and the comment is, is we also got those uh, quantitatively, not simply qualitatively. Yep. Yeah. I'm kind of curious about the level of theory. Uh, I don't know, it might be more a question for Steve than for Bob, but either of you could take a shot. Is, are these uh, basically born approximation calculations or distorted wave? Uh, born, uh, no, they, they, they were born approximation uh, for, the, um, for the scattered particle, but distorted wave for the, uh, ejected particle, uh, if, if that makes sense. So it was not distorted wave born, it was plane wave born, but using, um, I mean, that, that we, it was always difficult because people used to use um, plane wave for the ejected particle as well. And the results weren't even order of magnitude right then. Yeah. That's right. So we Thanks. used either Hartree-Slater or Hartree-Fock for the, uh, particularly for the continual electron. That was the- uh, I see. The okay, um, very good, Bob. Let's um, turn to our next speaker, Maria Pian Castelli, uh, who will, from Uppsala University, deliver the talk, Spectroscopy and Dynamics of Rare Gas Atoms in the Hard X-Ray Domain. Okay, thanks. So, okay, C can you see my screen? Yeah. Is this, is this yes, working yes. okay? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. See, it's yes. fine. Yes. Okay, so uh, good afternoon. Uh, good night, good morning to everybody in whichever time zone you are. Good morning, Steve. And thanks for giving me the opportunity to participate in this celebration for 
a distinguished colleague and an old friend. So uh, my title is Petrovsky with dynamics or rare gas in the hard X-ray domain. So we have plenty of data in the spectroscopy and dynamics and hard ray domain for uh, atoms and molecules. So I was wondering which kind of subject I should choose. And then I remember this very fundamental quote. And this very fundamental quote is from Steve Madsen. So I decided to uh, concentrate on atomic spectroscopy. And so I will give uh, time permitting three examples, recoil phenomena, double cohort states, and non-statistical ratio of spin orbit components, this last one in collaboration with Steve. So uh, we, uh, all the experimental work I'm going to present has been taken on the beamline galaxies at the uh, Synchrotron Soleil near Paris in France. We work in hard X-ray, more precisely, we call this uh, energy region from two <clears throat> to 13 kilovolts tender X-rays. So in this region, there are lots of um, dynamical phenomena which were, were possible to observe in the uh, soft X-rays. Of course, there is a huge bulk of data on spectroscopy dynamics for red gases in the uh, soft X-rays, but we have studied some phenomena possible only in this particular region. So let's start with the uh, first one, which is recoil. And recoil basically means that uh, if you study a photoelectron spectroscopy and you have a, a photoelectron which leaves with a very high kinetic energy, the recoil, which the recoil kick, which the photoelectron gives to the molecular atomic ion left behind is not negligible at all. And you can study a lot of interesting phenomena in, in, uh, concerning the subject. So this is uh, one of the first papers we had out of galaxy. We study neon. So uh, this is the philosophy of the experiment. We uh, measure neon and the K edge, and we measure the uh, Auger electrons. So we have uh, the synchrotron beam in this direction, the E vector, and since we ionize the neon 1s electron, the uh, photoelectrons angular distribution will be a P wave. So they will be basically distributed this way. And we uh, collect the Auger electron with our spectrometer, which is uh, placed here. So it's parallel to the E vector. So what happens when we collect the Auger electrons? We have the photoelectrons which leave, and if they leave with enough kinetic energy, they will give a recoil kick to the neon ions left behind. So we'll, you have some neon ions moving in this direction, so away from the detector, and some neon ions moving towards the detector. And when we collect the Auger electrons, then there will be a blue shift for the Auger electrons collected from neon ions moving in this direction, and the red shift for the opposite direction. And if the photoelectrons are um, energetic enough, at the end, there will be a splitting this uh, red and blue shift peaks will be split. So let's look at the uh, experimental results. So this is uh, one particular state in the Auger spectrum for the neon. And we just picked up this state because it's isolated, but it holds for the whole spectrum. So uh, the kinetic energy is the same because we study uh, this OJ peak, but these spectra are taken as a function of the kinetic energy of the ejected photoelectron. So we start at three kilovolts and we arrive at as high as we can go in galaxy, more than 12 kilovolts. And you can clearly see that this uh, OJ peak shows some uh, dramatic change. And uh, basically it becomes wider and wider, and finally it splits in these two components, which is this Auger Doppler effect, which is due to recoil. So this is uh, uh, an example of recoil effects. In this case, we study an atom. So this is, um, of course, it's a translational recoil, but we have lots of data also on rotational and vibrational recoil in this hard X-ray regime for uh, molecules. Okay, so uh, next example, double cohol. Double, double cohol spectroscopy uh, very recently uh, has become 
quite fashionable in the last uh, six or seven years. Double cohort spectroscopy means to remove both the electrons from an inner shell, which is typically uh, 1s in the shell. And in historic, historically speaking, was measured as synchrotrons by doing electron electron coincidence or as a free electron laser by um, doing the consecutive absorption of two photons fast enough not to have uh, OJ decay in between. Okay, so let's see, for instance, what happens with neon. If we have a, a photon beam energetic enough, one can extract both uh, uh, 1s electrons at the same time and bring them in the continuum. And the I, we have a doubly charged ion. And then this doubly charged ion will decay in two OJ steps. The first one is called hypersatellite because it's much more energetic than the uh, OJ decay for neon uh, singly ionized. But another possible process is again to create double co-holes, but one electron in the continuum and the other electron excited an empty state. So here we have only one for the electron emitted and we have singly charged neon. And also this state will decay for with first hypersatellite OJ decay and then regular OJ decay. Now on galaxy, we cannot measure this event, the um, double ionization because we use regular electrospectroscopy, and so we can collect one for the electron at a time, but we can measure all these other processes. We can measure this um, state with two coholes and one excited electron, and we can measure all these types of OJ decay because uh, we have one electron emitted at a time. So let's see the uh, results. So this is the photoelectron spectrum for uh, double coholes in neon. And you can see the states, well, all states have uh, two electrons missing in the 1s shell and then one electron excited in a Rydberg series, which could be the ns or the np Rydberg series. So if you're familiar with the um, shakeup, you can call this state super shakeups. And we can also distinguish them like one do with the um, regular shakeups with direct channel, a conjugate channel, so we can have either uh, dipole ionization and monopole uh, shakeup or um, uh, dipole excitation and monopole uh, shakeoff. And what about the OJ decay? Okay, this is the OJ spectrum for neon. This is the neon KLL uh, OJ decay from the uh, singly charge for the single vacancy. So if you want to study the hypersatellite, you have to look down here. And of course, we have a, something like four order magnitudes in lower intensity, but we, we can actually measure okay. this. Take a minute, connect to our Bluetooth. Okay. And so this is the assignment for these peaks. So we have big, basically uh, three categories of peaks. The narrow peaks uh, come from the uh, OJ decay of the single hole and the wider peaks from the OJ decay of the double core hole because there is, a, of course, a difference in the core hole lifetime if you have one or two vacancies. And one interesting thing is that here, some of these wider structures have this long tail that we can recognize as a post-collision interaction tail. And this depends on the fact that if you have two photoelectron ejected at the, main at the same time, la the um, energy sharing is not equal. So you always have one slow and one fast photoelectron. So you can always have a post-collision interaction even if we are very far from threshold. Okay, uh, last example. This is a paper which is not out yet, it's just submitted. That's our collaboration with Steve and also with our chairman. And so it's not statistical behavior of the photoionization spin orbit doublets. And we have studied argon and xenon. I have just time to talk about argon. So we measure the argon 2p doublet, the 2p 3 half and the 2p uh, 1 half states. And we were looking for basically two uh, information. One, this ratio is non-statistical, it's very, it's well known and, and measured that it's not statistical close to threshold. But what happens if we go very far away from threshold? There were theoretical predictions that is still non-statistical, but it wasn't measured. 
And the other question was, what happens when uh, we measure this, uh, this ratio around the uh, inner shell, the argon 1s inner shell? And if you are around the argon 1s inner shell, you can have just below the uh, threshold, the excitation from the argon 1s to the NP series. And then one possible decay would be participate or decay. So the same final states as the direct photoionization argon 2p. So let's just look at the results. This is in blue, you have the experimental points and a fit with the experiment. And in red is the curve, the, the theory by Steve. And we went up to 4,000 EV in uh, photon energy. And you can clearly see that this ratio is not only stays non-statistical, but decreases as a function of photon energy. And the reason for that is that if you think of the dipole matrix element, you, you have a very fast photoelectron and the continuum wave function is oscillation, uh, the, it's oscillating pretty much, which counts is the the uh, radius very, very close to the nucleus, where it's known that the uh, 2p3 half and the 2p1 half wave functions are different. And this difference is reflected in this uh, non-statistical ratio. What about the region close to uh, the 1s threshold? Here you have really pronounced oscillation in the experimental data, the simulation and the theory, which depends from the fact that you have this, uh, uh, um, OJ participatory decay and the direct ionization of the two P states. So you have this final interference, which is different for two P three half and two P one half. And so this is the difference which is uh, reflected here. Okay, Maria, I guess. Maria, you have um, three yes. minutes. Okay, just uh, just uh, thanking the the collaborators. So the SP MR team in Paris, Ralph Pittner from Berlin, uh, the Galaxies team, and finally, the final thank is for Steve. Steve, if you remember, this picture was taken at a very nice uh, uh, seafood dinner on a boat in Australia. We were there for the peak, and was uh, very dangerous waters infested with crocodiles, but was a real nice dinner. So thanks, Steve. And I thank remember you. it well. <laughs> Okay, thanks. Very nice. Um, so yes, go ahead and unmute and uh, ask any questions if you'd like. Might I ask a question here? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Um, yes. Um, thank, yes. You for the, thank you for the beautiful data. Um, I'm not sure I fully understood the uh, geometry in the first part. Uh, the, you had the photoelectrons going off in two opposite directions, giving you a redshift and a blue shift. But, um, but wait, no, no, the, the redshift, the blue shift is for the OJ electrons. Sorry, the redshift and the blue shift? Is for the OJ electrons, not for the photoelectrons. Yes, that's right. Um, but now uh, there is also, uh, that's right, the, the, there is also a question, um, uh, if you're photo exciting, that there would be um, a shift due to the absorption of the photon. I mean, there would be a, um, a recoil due to absorption of the photon. I suppose you're not sensitive to that. No, we always negligent, we always consider that negligible. The, the, yes, you but, have to go to some. But that is a very interesting part of the recoil phenomenon. As I remember, there was a paper by. Arnold Sommerfeld, um, uh, a paper in which he criticized Heitler um, for introducing the dipole approximation because that, of course, results in no recoil. Um, and so a, a way of measuring the quadrupole contribution um, to absorption is to look for that recoil. So maybe if you're going to x-rays, um, going to the hard x-rays is rather interesting for that reason. Sure. I mean, th this is some ideas we have for the long term to go to really, really high hard x-rays to look at this kind of problem, to look at Compton scattering and things which yes. are typical, even harder x-rays than what we can measure now. Yes. 
thinker. Any other questions for Maria? Okay. Uh, well, I'm, I'll just ask quickly the cause of the breakdown of the statistics. Is that something more radial dynamic? I don't know if that's for you or Steve. Yes. I mean, if you look at the uh, radial function for the 2p3 half and 2p1 half very close to the nucleo, the nucleum, the nucleus, the ratio is not one. It's very far from one, actually. That, that's the main reason why it, is, it keeps non-statistical. Actually, if, if you make the calculation for r going to, to zero, this ratio diverges. So it's really the, the main effect. Right, Steve? Absolutely. <laughs> Yes. Perfect. Okay, um, we're uh, keeping really good time here. I uh, appreciate it from everyone. Let me introduce the next speaker is Wayne Stolte uh, with the title, A Study of the Near Threshold Region for Double Photoionization of Atomic Oxygen. Go ahead, Wayne. Hello. Um, let me see if I can share here. Yeah, that's coming in. It's coming in. Is it full screen or? There we go. Okay, I'm so first off, I'm sorry. I don't have a camera, so you can't see my lovely face, but you can see my uh, picture of my dog. Um, second off, a very happy birthday to Steve. I'm very uh, um, glad and honored that I was invited to uh, join this uh, fine group. Um, I'm, as most of you know, I'm just a, a, a French turner. So I'm the one they call to actually, when someone like Steve has a wonderful idea, I'm the one that they help call to uh, set the experiment up, to build it, um, to figure out which beamline to run it on. Um, so I was a beamline scientist at the Advanced Light Source. Um, and this, this experiment was something that um, has, has a lot of history to it. So I'm going to go first through a little bit of that. Um, changing. There we go. Uh, so first, I you know I was supported by the Advanced Light Source on this project. So at the time, I was working for UNLV also, um, but this was more in line with uh, my work as a beamline scientist. So the history I mentioned was when I when I first graduated ages ago, I was in Jim Sampson's group. And my very, very, very first project was to go to the Wisconsin Light Source, Aladdin, and help take down an experiment that they had just performed, which was studying the Vanier law, the double ionization threshold of atomic oxygen. So this is the data that they published a year after I joined the group. So it was done by John He and Jim Sampson and uh, Jeff Cutler. So I actually was not involved with the gathering of this data. Um, Jim was super interested in direct double ionization thresholds. So in this case, he ran oxygen. He ran it earlier with, uh, with uh, Gordon Angel uh, with the time of flight. So um, that's that part of the history. The second part was when I was finishing my tenure with Jim's group, our very last project was to try to study the double and triple ionization threshold of neon. So this is kind of at the same time Bob was doing his measurements, Jim and our group were working on it also. Um, after I left Jim's group, I actually ran the experiment again multiple times. 
uh, on different beam lines um, with, with varying degrees of success. Um, the data was never published. Uh, one of the big issues is, as you can see on uh, the right hand side, is the scatter in the data. Um, some of that is probably due to higher order contamination, um, issues with actually the photon beam coming in. Even though we use filters and other things to minimize these issues, this was done early on. They didn't, they didn't have a whole lot of things like order sorters and things to sort out the data, uh, the photon beam. Um, so the experimental technique, I'm an experimentalist, I'm not a theoretician, so I'm, I'm talking wrench turning. Um, we actually perform many different experiments to come up with this curve that we originally had. So we needed to do precision total photoionization measurements. So you know the total cross section of the atom. Uh, then you need to do branching ratios. So how much of double versus triple versus single ionization do you have at those energies? And then finally, because time of flight takes a super long time and you don't always have timing on the storage ring, we use a magnetic mass spectrometer during multi-bunch mode to actually generate the, uh, the, the curves you see. So uh, very quickly for some of you out there, an ion time of flight, it's a, a very old technique. Um, it's basically you have a uh, photon beam going between the push and pull plate. You create ions, uh, an electrostatic field, pulls the ion towards your detector, in this case, an MCP, it's a multi-channel plate. And then the timing is arrived by the uh, 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 photon beam signal from the storage ring. And you get what you see on the right, which is uh, branching ratios between the various ions and charge states. Um, when we go to multi-bunch mode, this is why I've used the majority of time for my measurements um, over the past 20 plus years is a magnetic mass spectrometer. Um, you have an ion chamber and a lens and you measure the mass to charge or you measure the mass through, through the uh, magnetic mass spectrometer. So they all, every uh, mass to charge ratio has a different path through the magnet, different voltage required. Um, the advantage to this is you don't need the storage ring to be in a special timing mode where there's one or two photons in the storage ring at a time. You can run multi-bunch mode, so you can, which is the majority of the beam time. So it's a continuous experiment. Um, so for this experiment, you need to generate atomic oxygen. So I had a recipe, I, I learned it um, in Jim's group and then over the years slightly modified it. Um, it's, it's chemistry in, in test tubes, right? So you run mixtures of gases, in this case, oxygen and nitrogen. You have to make sure you have a quartz tube. If you use Pyrex, it doesn't work. If you use glass, it doesn't work. It has to be quartz. Um, you have to coat the tube with Teflon. Uh, put phosphorus pentoxide in there. It's, it's not a, a friendly chemical, but you put it in there. You shake it, you have a powder on the surface and you have to let humidity act, so more chemistry. This is to actually keep the oxygen from recombining into the molecule. And um, it, it works super well. And then you also have to increase the pumping speed. So in the end, I get about 90% dissociation. 
um, previously we were getting around uh, 60 percent. So now I'm pulling about 90 percent. So the results I obtained um, are the black curve. Um, the energy levels you see are, I went back to what we did in the first paper using the more energy tables. Um, so these are just where the double, doubly excited states have their thresholds. Um, the ionization threshold at 48.7, that was derived by this data and we compared it to the previous results and it's very, very close. Um, so this data was, cal so the calibration is to the ANGEL and Samson data. And it's just around, we used around 65 EV is the calibration point. So that's what puts us on an absolute scale was that data. Um, the previous data was calibrated at 60, but as you can see, there's structure there. So if you're trying to calibrate um, to a branching ratio or a, a total yield measurement at 60, you're gonna have problems. Um, the triangles are the key data. Um, and as you can see, I mean, that's all the data. So that's the step sizes. Um, and then you can see that there is a series of resonances overlying the double ionization continuum. Um, what interests me was I had, I have beam time to do atomic oxygen measurements um, at the K-shell K measurements for astrophysics measurements. So this was a repeat of data to prove that my system was working. I had gotten beam time on beamline 10 um, and beamline 10 doesn't go to 500 volts. So I had to dream up something to test my system. So I reran this data and the goal originally was, was not to actually have anything to publish because I didn't think there would be anything new here. In the end, if you if we look, um, these resonances actually split, which to me was very interesting. So you have a three halves one half series here. I did not expect that. Is he, I mean, if you look at the he data, the triangles, I mean, he didn't have the resolution. So when he went through and did the calculations, it looked just like a single series. Although, I mean, wide peaks, but a single series. Um, this one, it, it obviously is two series merging to what looks like a common continuum. Um, to me, this, this was, when I saw this, I, that's when I talked to Tom, actually. And we'll go back two slides. And uh, Tom and his student did some calculations on, on this with, uh, well, Tom will, Tom will have to tell you if he can chime in for a second, because I don't know much about theory. It was, it was just using the R matrix with pseudo state to discretize the second continuum emitted, continuum electron, RNPS. Yeah, so thank you. Um, so obviously it, it doesn't- Oh, and, um, and there are three minutes. <laughs> I got three minutes, okay. So, and obviously it, it's, the agreement isn't wonderful. So, you know, the, the comments earlier that, oh, we, we know, yeah, we know a lot more about double ionization uh, for calculations, but I mean, we, we got a ways to go. Um, then I did a, a check of the Vanier law um, I had a lot more data with a lot better statistics. Um, so here, here are the numbers actually. Mine are 1.036 and then theory was 1.056 roughly. And John, he did 1.077. Um, it's all within, I'm gonna say within the experimental error bars. So um, we're all coming up with very close to the same number. 
Um, and with that, uh, I'll say thank you very much and happy birthday, Steve. Thank you. Ready? Let's uh, open up for questions. Yeah. Can I ask a little? Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Just a question. It is very nice to see that you have got 90% dissociation fraction. Uh, since uh, I used to work on this atomic hydrogen, I think it is very difficult to get high degree of dissociation fraction. Question is, uh, how do you measure that dissociation fraction? Maybe Say again, please. How did you measure the dissociation fraction? The 90% is very good, very nice number. Yes. Uh, it's yes. very difficult to get such a high degree of dissociation, I know. Just yes, it's very you... difficult. Yes. So what we do is actually measure um, how much of the molecule remains. Okay. So we did a, a measurement, um, trying to think what energy it was at. Um, but anyway, there, it was actually performed on the synchrotron, so at a, a single photon energy. Mm -hmm. um, measuring through the magnetic mass spectrometer okay oxygen the molecule o2 plus mm -hmm. and running it with various conditions and seeing how the dis how much of it remained yes yes okay i got it okay thank you you're welcome uh, this is a comment from ravi rao a beautiful experiment and i just wanted to say that the uh, small differences in the exponent between uh, 1.036 or 056 is uh, not quite as significant as the fact that it is larger than one. And so the fact that it enters zero with a zero slope, and so it shows the suppression that the one year mechanism does from the linear law. I, I have a quick question. How do you know the dissociated oxygen is in the ground state, or do you? Um, actually, it. Um, let me go back to here. So you'll see this little section on the glass tube that sticks out to the right. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things that helps ensure that we are in the ground state. The other is the sheer distance to the target area, right? So there's a, a very long flow path from the microwave cavity through to the ion chamber. That, that takes uh, many, many microseconds for the gas to go through, it decays. Oh, and we have, not, we have not observed actually vibrational structure or anything else due to excited states. Well, there wouldn't be, if it's atomic oxygen, there wouldn't be any vibrational structure, but the excited states are metastable. Right. And, uh, and you, would, know, you would actually, you would observe those actually in your, in your spectra. You would see it. I see, and you don't, okay. And we don't. Now, if I do, if I run um, this discharge system on a time of flight, we're actually closer and you actually do observe I see. other lines. Yes. OK, um, perfect timing here. Thank you, Wayne. If you can stop sharing the, um, the slide now, thank you. And our next speaker is Fadi Hassalou from Hassan Kalyansu University with the title, as you see, K-shell fluorescence yield and photoabsorption calculations. Go ahead, Fadi. Uh, hi, everyone. So I hope you can see my slide and you can hear me well. So here, today I'm going to present you some of the uh, some of the work that I did while I was a PhD student with Tom. And at that time, Steve was an external committee member in my PhD. Uh, and 
I learned a lot from him. He is a great mentor, you know, just he has the phone available 24 hours. So anytime when I stuck, so he was just giving me his opinion. So I'm going to show most of the stuff that we, that we have uh, done with Steve. And so specifically, I will talk about KHL fluorescence yield and photoabsorption calculations. And here is the outline of my talk. And first I will talk about the uh, fluorescence yield calculations. I will show a couple of stuff uh, for, the, for, the, for the fluorescence yield. Later I will switch to photoabsorption calculations and mainly I will show a published work for the carbon ions and I will show the silicon uh, cross section that we are working on it. And so, Mainly fluorescence yields are important for the modeling of the photoionized plasmas and casual vacancy plasmas that occurs in various uh, cosmic X-ray resources. And at that time when we were doing this fluorescence yield calculation in literature, we found that there are only a few or, and some of them are inaccurate calculations, theoretical and experimentals are, were also a few. So we said, okay, let's then do this work. And so fluorescence yield is basically the ratio between the radiative uh, rate to the uh, flow, uh, OJ rates. And it's just a number between zero to one. So in order to understand the behavior, it's good to look at the hydrogenic dependence radiative rates that scale as z to the four and the OJ rates that scales as z to the zero. So that gives us a good idea about the behavior along the isonuclear sequence and which can be converted in this form by defining a ratio between the radiative rate to the OJ rate. So for different A values, so I'm showing you the plot. As you can see for higher Z values along the isoelectronic sequence, it is approaching to one. So we expect that kind of curves. And so when we look at the literature at that time, most commonly used database was, uh, was created by Kasra and Mewe, including the all astrophysically important uh, elements and ions from beryllium to zinc. And this is just one part from their database uh, from that paper. So that's giving us the fluorescence uh, probability and the one electron and two electron emission uh, ejection probabilities as well. Specifically on this database for iron 23 plus, as you can see, it says no fluorescence. And that will be also touching to that point in the coming slides. Okay, so now I would like to compare this database, how they have obtained this database and what we are doing. First of all, actually they have used the McGurry data datas that is doing the explicit calculation for singly ionized atoms. Then they did the extrapolation and Z scaling for the other members. And in this data, actually single configuration was used and LS coupling without relativistic calculation. And at the end in the database, they are doing kind of some configuration averaging and giving just only one fluorescence yield that the astrophysics people that can use. But in our, uh, in our uh, calculation, we used the auto structure. We did a uh, multi-configuration bright Pauli approximation and we explicitly calculated all members of the isoelectronic sequences. And we, we included the configuration interaction. So, and also we did the calculation for all LSJ states, including the relativistic effects. And we have, uh, we have obtained all LSJ dependent fluorescence yields so that can be used for modeling purpose. And for, uh, let's look at the lithium-like results. If we, I mean, for instance, for the iron 23 plus, if you look at it, the only in the single configuration presentation, the only channel it can decay is the OJ channel. So there will be no fluorescence. So the fluorescence yield is zero. And on the database, we found that 
it's just all zero for all, uh, all Z values. But if you study the same problem with the, in the multi-configuration description with the, with the dominant mixture or the ground state or lithium K shell vacancy is this, and this gives a chance to decay uh, via, via fluorescence uh, channel. And this mixing is around 10%, so which creates a, uh, or approximately like 0.12 fluorescence yield. And this is actually a significant number compared to zero. And we did all the, all the calculations and also in the, in the, in the literature, there are some data was, uh, was calculated by Chen by using MCDF and there are other, other papers where we can extract these fluorescence yields. As you can see, when we put all them together, our calculation gives a good agreement in the, for, the, for, for the fluorescence yield. And we made a uh, paper out of it where we state the importance of configuration, in, configuration interaction for such calculations. And for boron-like boron -like, uh, iso, isoelectronic sequence, we have calculated all the LSJ states. As you can see from the, uh, considering that the number is changing from zero to one, as we can see, it is strong, there is a strong LSJ dependence. So instead of giving configuration interaction, it is good to give the results as uh, J-dependent J like this. So we made another paper where we state the uh, importance of uh, there is a strong LSJ dependence for such calculations. And lastly, uh, I, I, will, I will show the, our carbon, uh, carbon results. So here I am showing the fluorescence yields for all LSJ levels. <coughs> when we look at this, when we look at this, you see for all of them, there is a nice behavior but for the triplet S1 and the triplet P1 state, there is a, there is a, a strange behavior in the range from Z10 to the 20. So we were, we decided to look at the individual, individual OJ rates. And so when we look at the OJ, OJ rates, actually you can see also in the OJ rates that uh, anomalous behavior exists. But in the radiative rate section, we can see. At that time, I discussed the issue with Steve, and he said, "Why don't you just let's do the scaling z to the four because it is the hydrogenic scaling as uh, extract the more information out of it." And when we do the z scaling, as you can see, also the radiative rates have that similar behavior, and later. Considering that these are the same J levels, so they might be interacting through the spinorbid effects. We have studied the energy levels and we found that there is an energy crossing. And because of that energy crossing, that spinorbid effect uh, uh, occurs. And we turn off the, we, we excluded the spinorbid interaction between these two states. As you can see, it's giving us this, this curve and, but, Actually, it should be like that because the spin orbit effect exists, so we cannot exclude it. We, we published that as a PRA paper uh, where we state that, where we found that even though low Z values, uh, you, we may think that spin orbit effects or some relativistic effects might not be important, but due to such unexpected uh, phenomena, uh, this kind of things happen. So for this calculation, it is always good to include the, uh, uh, in, include such uh, effects as much as possible. Okay, now I would like to talk about our photoabsorption calculation. And in order to in order to accurately uh, accurately model the X-ray uh, spectroscopy, astrophysics people need. Uh, uh, need uh, accurate uh, photoabsorption values, and we have received that uh, that picture from one of our colleagues from uh, our Smithsonian Center. This energy range falls into the range of the carbon spectrum, 
and they, they he was suspicious that these absorption features might be from the atoms and on beside uh, due to the polymite filter they are using in the in the telescope so we we start out working on the carbon and for the carbon this is the this is what's happening to, to when you hit the extra, enough photon energy and this this shell, uh, this K shell we can say can relax back to by uh, through participator OJ decay, and also we are we are including all these channels in our R matrix calculations. Uh, but there are also other decay channels which cannot be directly included in the uh, in the R matrix calculations. So we have included them implicitly by using a optical potential by adding an uh, imaginary part to the energy energy levels. So then we have obtained this uh, uh, cross-section, which is has a good background agreement with the independent particle model. Uh, and so as I mentioned, as I mentioned, these OJ broadening effects are important. So these are the 1s to 2p, these are the higher levels. And these OJ uh, broadening effects are important for the higher values. As you can see here, red lines are with the OJ broadening effects. As you can see, it is dominating the higher, higher, higher n values. And if you look closer, so at, even at at n equal three, there is, that's very significant. Fadi, you have three minutes, okay? Awesome. And we did the carbon plus calculations and there was an LS experiment which was including the ground state and the metastable at mixture. They have only studied the lower energy levels. So we have also investigated the metastable state along with the ground state. And we have compared these low energy values and we have found a good agreement between our calculation with the experiment, I mean, within the resonance positions within the 0.45 electron volt. And these are the, uh, these are the, these are the, this is the cross section for carbon plus. And similarly for carbon two plus, uh, there was an X ALS experiment. So uh, including that, but we have found a similar good agreement. So I'm not going to show to save up the time. This is our cross section. At the end of the day, these cross sections are used to mo model the spectra that I have showed. Uh, and there was a significant carbon, carbon plus and carbon two plus uh, absorptions was detected in, the, in, the, in there. And later we published this as a paper and this was also came out as a, on Chandra News as the first detection of interstellar uh, carbon plus ion. And nowadays, nowadays we are working on silicon. And for silicon, actually, oh, we are opening up the N equal three, and which actually uh, significantly increases the increases the size of the problem. We have included all these channels uh, as we did for carbon, but as I mentioned, that too many. Uh, these calculations gets really difficult compared to carbon. Now, these are this is the uh, cross section without without bro uh, broadening effects. So when we include the OJ broadenings by using this our calculated OJ rates, uh, we get these results. Now we are working on a paper to publish, including all other ions that I am not showing here. And lastly. These cross sections are already used uh, to analyze the, to model the X-ray spectrum uh, and you uh, published in a, in a work, a recent paper. Okay, thank you. And happy birthday, Steve. Thank you. Thank you, Fadi. Uh, go ahead with any questions. Anyone uh, speak up there, please. Okay, I am going to move on here. It wouldn't be right for me to ask you a question, Fadi. 
Um, so let us uh, proceed with our next speaker, um, Emma Sokol from University College Dublin with the talk, Coincidence Photoelectron Measurements Following 2P Photoionization in Magnesium. Go ahead, Emma. Thank you. I presume you could hear me and see those slides, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so first of all, thanks very much for giving me the privilege of being able to speak at this meeting. It, it really does mean quite a lot. Uh, I'm going to present data that many of you may have seen before, but hopefully I can tell it with a different story today. Um, before I begin, I'm going to give two examples of coincidence measurements in magnesium. I'm an experimentalist, and as Steve said near the beginning of today's session, I mean, really our experiments, we need theoretical support to try and interpret the data. And the two examples that I'm going to talk about today, Anatoly Kaifetz and Igor Bray uh, helped us with one set with the CCC calculations and our chairman and Steve helped us with the other with their relativistic random phase approximation calculations which date back to the 1980s and the experimental work that I'm going to show you couldn't have happened without the collaboration I have with Paolo and Lorenzo um, and we work at the Electra beam line in Trieste. So by way of beginning uh, the sort of typical system for studying double photoionization, single photon double ionization is helium. And I'm gonna talk about uh, experiments that use the sort of traditional method rather than the more common methods these days where you have two uh, energy analyzers and you discriminate against the angle of emission of the two electrons and you measure those two electrons in coincidence. And typically what used to happen is one of the analyzers would be called the fixed analyzer. And the coincidence rate of what was often called the rotatable analyzer for obvious reasons with that a particular energy sharing was measured as a function of the angle of that second rotatable analyzer. And the, the triple differential cross sections have these kind of lobe shapes. So if this is the defined electron direction for the first electron, the second one, for equal energy sharing can come out back to back and you get these nice lobes and the lobes can be described by a Gaussian plus a kinematic factor which suppresses this back to back emission. And you can see that as you change the angle of the fixed analyzer, the shapes of the lobes change. And helium is obviously a reasonable start point because once you take away the two electrons, you're just left with the bare nucleus and then Another sort of step from that, so this beyond here, could be if we were to work down the alkali earth uh, series, because if you take away the outer two electrons from each of those elements, you're left with a closed shell. And it's those kind of experiments that I'm going to try and give you a flavor of today. Um, so the experiments, even in gas targets, are quite challenging. Uh, and if you add in that you have to get your alkali earth solid element into the gas phase to do these experiments, it makes them even more difficult. So to my knowledge, there's only one other, there's only one measurement of a direct double photoionization, so gamma 2e in alkali earths in calcium. And this was published in 2000. And you can see this, the comparison is between helium, which are the empty points with an excess energy of 20 EV, so 10 EV for each of the two electrons, and the dark points of the calcium data where the excess energy is just slightly bigger. And probably of note is that the lobe for the calcium data is significantly narrower than the helium, and that's possibly due to uh, increased electron-electron correlation. And one reason I have for showing this particular example today is that it's sort of how I got into this field is that John West and Kevin Ross, when they were retiring, they donated the spectrometer that uh, took these measurements to myself. And it's still sort of in use in our lab in UCD. So that's how I got into this. Sort of a bit ironic because as a PhD student, I always wanted to do these kind of coincidence measurements when I was in Manchester but uh, I wasn't in the right part of the group to do them. So uh, now, as I said, the experiments are difficult uh, and 
Because of that, uh, the multi coincidence spectrometer, which lives at the gas phase beam line at the electrosynchrotron, was developed and it has 10 analyzers. So, without going into too much detail of how they're set up, effectively, one set of analyzers, these three here, are three different fixed analyzers, and this array of seven will rotate so that for every set of measurements, you get 21 coincidences for the price of one, if you see what I mean. So the idea of this spectrometer was to try and make the, the measurements more efficient. Now, Cold Trims also does this kind of thing very efficiently, but uh, what I want to emphasize here is again, we're picking two different angles, um, setting the energies of these analyzers, the hemispherical analyzers with quite a long lens to perform these triple differential cross sections. And hopefully we get some kind of coincidence peak and we can look at the size of that peak or the coincidence count rate and work out information about our double photoionization process. So how we came into the collaboration was that the John West, Kevin Ross experiment had an oven and their initiative or their innovation was to put the oven uh, along parallel with the photon direction. So in this diagram, the photons are coming from the back and we put a similar but different uh, copy of that design into the Electra spectrometer and that's where the collaboration resulted. So what their uh, design consists of is two chambers and then this front disc has six angled holes. So the idea is that... Um, Xiaowang, I think you have to uh, mute your microphone, please. Okay, so the atomic, the idea is that by these beveled holes, six atomic beams come out from the oven and that those beams cross at the interaction region of the photons and the line of sight of the analyzers. So these are the 10 analyzers. This is the oven. And you can see that, well, you can't see, but I'm going to tell you that this space is quite tight, something like two to three centimeters across here. So it's quite small area. But what I wanted to show is quite often people are quite skeptical as to whether this actually works. So what this is, is the front plate, the backside of the front plate. And you can see these holes, a couple of them are blocked, but you can see these holes. So these were the beams and this is a magnesium deposit. You can also see here a shadow a multiple shadow of the gas needle that we have in for calibration. And there's a, a plate here. And if you look on the back of this plate, so you you see these kind of six petals, if you will, which to me look a bit like cucumbers, but these are the um, beams as they hit the back door of the analyzer. So I think we can be quite confident that the uh, system works. So the first example I wanted to briefly talk about was a double photoionization in magnesium, but this time it's not direct. The 2p electron is excited to the 3d resonance, and I'm not going to talk in great detail here. I'm just going to sort of highlight the, the main finding. So again, we have magnesium on the left and helium on the right the excess energy of each of the electrons for the magnesium is from like 16 EV. And here again, it's 10 and 10. So it's similar, but slightly different. So if we think about this sort of Gaussian parameterization that I just mentioned, essentially there's a parameter, which is the width. Uh, and what I want to highlight is that the CCC calculation does very well at generating or reproducing the data. But uh, if we think about a kind of physical picture, what you find is that the single Gaussian parameterization isn't perfect and you need another contribution. So another Gaussian parameterization to uh, define the experimental data. And the physical origin of that second Gaussian is if we take the model that the double photoionization happens by electron impact. So the first electron that's freed frees the second. 3s electron, and then the two electrons are in the continuum, then the first electron that's going to then ionize the second 3s electron 
sees the radial distribution of that 3s electron and that has more than one node so that we have different Gaussians associated with different parts of the wave function. And when we measure those, the fo double photoionization event, we can't tell which part of the wave function was responsible. And we get an interference between those two contributions. And the reason why there are not three contributions is one part of the wave function is so sharp that we, it won't contribute significantly to our data. So moving on to our, my second example, and this is the one where Steve Seary has helped us a lot. What we also have done is do coincidence measurements between a photoelectron and a subsequent Auger electron. Magnesium is a really nice system because again, once you take away the two, three S electrons, you're left with a closed shell. And in particular, we looked at L3, M1, M1. So ionization of the two P3 halves electron and what we used was Volker Schmidt's two-step model where he split the event into the photoelectron part, which is described by our two matrix elements, our D and our S wave, and then an OJ part, which for this particular case has only one partial wave, which is a P wave. Um, we split the, the process into two parts and we use that to try and model the TDCSs that we observed. And again, I'm not going to go into great detail, but what you can see is this part here is to do with the photoelectron part. This part here is to do with the OJ electron. There's OJ asymmetry defined by this alpha parameter, which is minus one. And effectively what we're going to do is model our TDCS in terms of the uh, dipole matrix elements for the S and the D wave and the phase between them. Uh, what we did probably drew quite heavily on work from the late 1980s where experimentally the dipole matrix elements and this phase angle were determined. The experiment was quite similar to the one we performed except for they didn't use coincidence measurements, they just used photoelectron measurements and then they used a measurement of the absolute photoionization cross-section as well. So again, I just want to use this to emphasize that we did coincidence measurements between the P3 halves photoelectron and its corresponding OJ partner, which has an energy of about 35 EV. Uh, so using the experimentally determined uh, dipole matrix elements, uh, which compare very well with the, the various theories. Here's the relativistic random phase approximation uh, of the series that do, the experiment doesn't really differentiate in between. But if you plug that into all of these expressions, which Volker Schmidt was helpful enough to publish in his book, we can see that this is what we would expect to observe. So in our experiment, we have three fixed analyzers, zero, 30 degrees and 60 degrees to the polarization axis. And you can see the kind of lobes that we would expect to see. So the red one is the zero one, it gets, the actual size gets a bit smaller. And then the one where we have the fixed analyzer at 60 degrees is the smallest. Emma, you have three minutes, okay? All right, I have to be quick, thank you. So uh, we, as I said, we use the theory of uh, Steve and our chairman to look at our data. I'm going to, say that what we used it for was to systematically test the two-step model. And here is our data. So you can see the points are our experimental data. Because the photoionization matrix elements are the same for each of the three sets of measurements, we did a global fit on the three sets simultaneously. And what you get out is the ratio of the uh, matrix elements and the phase. And the only other free parameter is some overall scale. And you can see, uh, as I said, the, the fit is a solid line. The dashed is derived from uh, Steve's theory. And you can see at 80 EV, so about 20 odd EV above threshold, the agreement is quite good. As we reduce the energy, so 70 EV, so now our photoelectron has a, a excess energy of about 10 EV. See, the agreement is still reasonably okay. But then if we go to much closer to threshold, 65, 64 EV, we can see that 
the agreement becomes less good. So again, the dashed is the theory, the solid is our fit, they diverge from each other and they don't really fit too well with the experiment. And just to show that in a, another light, here are our fit parameters. So this is the ratio of the D to the S uh, um, uh, dipole matrix element. The theory was calibrated on an experimental resonance here. Here's this point at ATV where there's a number of theories and you can see our data is maybe a little bit higher with bigger error bars, but we're not too far off the mark. And then what I want to finish with is just a comparison of available experimental data for, I should put NP photoionization here for different elements. So the black here is magnesium, the red is calcium and the blue is strontium. This minimum here in calcium is due to a Cooper minimum in the, the D cross section. And then you can see that broadly the agreement is not too bad. Uh, I wanted to emphasize that Steve and the chairman redid their calculations for us. So that was very helpful. And you can see that this solid line would have enabled us to calculate any TDCS that we wanted to. Uh, so hopefully, I think that's probably near the end of my three minutes. So I've shown you some unpublished OJ TDCS. Uh, tried to show you that we systematically studied the TDCS as a function of photon energy above threshold. The data may indicate that the two-step model is not applicable at photon energies lower than about 70 EV, which probably is not too surprising. Uh, we used, or we were provided with this RRPA theory from the 1980s to look at our data. Um, by way of conclusion and a sort of backhanded compliment, uh, a backhanded apology, uh, Steve has been um, getting on to me to finish writing the paper up. So hopefully I can give a belated present or Christmas or birthday and get, get it finished very soon. So thanks for listening. Very nice. Thank you, Emma. Um, if, if any of you would have a question, uh, just pipe in, please. I'll just comment that uh, it's so right. Whenever you have some conference like this, it forces you to get some work. Uh, uh, Steve and I have, you know, a lot of people have the same story. So yeah, yeah, very nice, Emma. Okay, let, um, any I, other- I had a, a question, uh, Emma. So did uh, you have an opportunity to try to, uh, test the validity of the uh, Vanier threshold law in any of your uh, measurements for these uh, elements heavier than helium? Not really, no, uh, is the short answer. I mean, I think uh, probably we might have some information, but my sense of it is, is that the error bars might be so big that it might not be very uh, informative. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Okay, um, we are actually a little bit ahead of schedule. Will miracles never cease? Um, let's move on to our next speaker, Daniel Rolls from um, Kansas State with a talk from non-dipole effects to electron ion coincidence spectroscopy. Go ahead, Daniel. All right, and um, thank you, Tom. And uh, it's great to be here. First of all, congratulations. Happy birthday, Steve. And uh, fitting to the occasion, trying to span in my talk a little bit, work I've done almost 20 years ago um, with Dennis Lindo and with Steve on non-dipole effects. And then uh, span a bridge to what we do 20 years later in my group, um, still working at the ALS synchrotron every once in a while doing their multi-bunch or two-bunch operation. So um, getting started, um, as many of you know, what uh, Dennis Lindell group, Lindell's group used to specif uh, specialize in was to look at non-dipole effects in photoelectron angle distributions. And those are highly sensitive probes of the photonization dynamics. And first I'm showing here the well-known formula for the photoelectron angle distribution and the dipole approximation. We all know that it 
depends on this on this anisotropy parameter beta. And then when we go to first order non-dipole, um, in addition to this angle to, with respect to the polarization direction, we can go out of the so-called dipole plane. So we can have an additional dependence on the angle um, with respect to the uh, photon propagation direction. And down here are some um, 3D renderings of what these distributions look like. So here along the axis, we can see the, the usual dipole beta distributions. And then as we go further to the right, we see that these distributions can kind of tilt out of the plane because of these uh, non-dipole parameters. And, you know, most of us always have in mind, well, non-dipole effect should be small because we know that electric uh, quadrupole and magnetic dipole is going to be much smaller than the electric dipole. And sort of this idea that they're probably negligible at low photon energies comes from the fact that for the total cross sections, of course, we look at the, the, the squares of all of these um, uh, contributions. However, if we look at the differential cross section, so the electron angular distribution, we have to keep in mind that in addition to the E1 square term, there are cross terms where we have the electric dipole multiplied with the electric quadrupole or the uh, magnetic dipole. So even though maybe the square may be small, these cross terms aren't as small. And in some cases, um, they can actually be quite uh, significant. Now, maybe as an experimental note, um, I think one, one, many people have tried to measure these non-dipole effects. Um, some have managed, many have failed, um, including myself sometimes when I thought, well, I could just measure this while I'm here at it. And uh, the reason I think why it's so difficult is if we measure any sort of distribution um, in not the right plane, then we always have the, the beta and the gamma and the delta parameter all in some combination. And it is really hard to get good enough statistic, good enough signal to noise to extract meaningful parameters. So sort of the, the genius um, that made these experiments so powerful in Dennis Lindner's group was this apparatus that Dennis and Oliver Hammers built that had several time of flight analyzers, including, you know, some at the zero degree and 90 degree and one at the dipole magic angle, but also one this analyzer three here at the non-dipole magic angle. And at this angle, you can measure this, uh, zeta parameter, gamma plus three delta, it comes directly out of um, doing ratio between the analyzers. And um, I think having the analyzer in this plane where we really only measure the zeta parameter in this, in this angle was one of the reasons why, why these measurements were able to measure these sometimes fairly small contributions. So just as an example of some of the work that was done on atoms, where Steve also contributed is here some measurements on uh, xenon 5s and then xenon 4d. And in this case, the parameters measured here is the gamma parameter. In this case, it's the zeta, so the gamma plus three delta. And you can see that these non-dipole effects in some places are definitely far away from zero. So there's um, some sort of a structure here close to threshold. And then in the 5s, um, distribution, there is this big bump close to the 4p threshold. And then similarly, here in the case of the 4d, um, you have a zeta parameter of close to zero, and then close to the 5p thre 4p threshold, you see this kind of dip in the, in, in the parameter. And, um, you know, I these papers have been a long time ago, so I had to reread a little bit about what we <laughs> What Steve told us what this was all about. Um, but bottom line is that the, the structure near the 4p threshold here in the xenon 5s angle distribution is due to interchannel coupling in the quadrupole channels, which he includes in his theory here. And then he does the same theory in the case for the 4d, and it doesn't work out. And the explanation where there was that we, or he attributed this to um, multiple excitation channels in the quadrupole manifold. So basically quadrupole satellites that were not included in the calculations. So you can see in order to kind of describe these effects, you have to really go very deep into your theory and include kind of obscure effects or the other way around. I, I guess that's the way I want to put it is if you look at these non-dipole effects, you're really sensitive to 
um, some some pretty um, special effects in the photonization dynamics. Now, um, personally, I actually think that atoms are one or yeah. One, one atom too many, I prefer to have molecules. So one of the experiments we did in Dennis groups also that I was really intrigued about was uh, looking at non-dipole effects and molecules. And in particular, we looked at the N2O molecule where just as a reminder, you have two chemically shifted nitrogen edges, the terminal nitrogen and the, the um, central nitrogen that are offset by about four EV binding energy because of the chemical shift of the oxygen. And so we can look at the electron angle distribution um, separately. And what we did in this experiment, we scanned all of them threshold out to hundreds of EV. And we found that when we cross the, uh, the region close to the oxygen 1s to 3p star resonance, the regular cross sections are flat, the beta parameters are flat, but the zeta parameter, the non dipole parameter of the central nitrogen, shows a dip which a terminal one does not. So again, this is a zeta parameter, which is gamma plus uh, three delta. And what we can see is that only the atom that's close to the oxygen shows this kind of dip and the one that's further away does not. And we dubbed this effect knocked. So nearest neighbor atom cohole transfer effect. So basically there is some quadrupole interaction and I think I have to wave my hands because that's sort of all I can do to explain this in a hand wavy way. Um, some quadruple interaction from the oxygen to the nearest neighbor. We did a similar measurement also in OCS, where we also have clearly distinct um, neighbor and nearest neighbor. And uh, we saw a similar effect in the carbon 1s emission when we went across the oxygen 1s to 4p star resonance, uh, 4, 4 pi star, I think it should be in here. So um, this was all done during my uh, PhD time. And that was exactly when free electron lasers got started. And I was really excited to use free electron lasers and this photoelectron spectroscopy to look at changing molecular structure and use the power of photoelectron spectroscopy, whether it's dipole, non-dipole, MF pads, to look at, uh, at changing molecular structure. We've done quite a few experiments since then, and it turns out that it's not easy to do time result photoelectron spectroscopy at an FEL. I think we're making inroads, but for the longest time, these experiments did not show the great effects we wanted to see. So we've kind of changed a little bit our, our winning strategy and have um, concentrated a little bit on more on ions. And I want to kind of make this jump now here in my talk as well and talk about um, what I do more these days, even though electron spectroscopy is still very close to my heart. And now we're looking at Coulomb explosion imaging. So seeing if we can learn something about the geometric structure from, of a molecule from the Coulomb explosion pattern when we detect several ions in coincidence. And uh, the example I want to talk about here is a dichloroethene molecule. So it's two isomers. And we have a double bond between the carbons, and then either the two chlorines are on the same side of the carbon double bond or on opposite side. This is called a cis isomer. This is a trans isomer. And the idea is that you can multiply ionize the molecule and blow it up into bits and pieces. For example, you know, using a strong field laser, which we do in my lab at Kansas State, or single and multiple X ray photons at a synchrotron or an FEL. And in this particular case, I Want to present an ALS experiment. We do initial ionization at 240 EV. We have an OJ decay. Sometimes we have two electrons that are being emitted in the OJ decay, so you can end up with a triply charged final state. And you can imagine <laughs> there's a charge on each of the chlorine and a charge on the C2H2 in the center. If you blow up the trans, I don't know if you guys can see my arms, but you could imagine that the two molecules, the two chlorines kind of fly straight out, more or less with a back-to-back -back 180 degree angle between them. Whereas if you blow up the cis, they kind of flow, fly at an angle. The two chlorines fly at an angle closer than 180 degrees. So we can, this is the little sketch of that. We can do the measurement. I'm plotting the momentum correlation. So the angle between the two chlorine plus that we've measured in coincidence 
along with a C, oh, I'm missing a two here, a C2H2 plus. And indeed, when we do this with a trans isomer, we find that the, um, we peak at an angle of 180 degrees, whereas if we do it with a cis isomer, we peak at an angle of close to 110 degrees. And the little arrows here, one thing that's important to realize, those are not the bond angles, but those are the angles you end up with after you take into account that, of course, the, the ions move under Coulomb repulsion. So we can do a Coulomb um, simulation where we just have point-like charges, purely Coulomb repulsion, the instantaneous breakup at equilibrium geometry, and then for the trans, we find 180 degrees as expected, and for the cis, we find um, some, some angle close to the one that we observe in the experiment. Now, how do we do this technically? As I said, we do it at the ALS. We have something that maybe looks similar to a cold trims. We have two delay line detectors. However, this is actually a double-sided velocity map imaging spectrometer. So it's sort of a cold trims meets VMI. Um, and the reason being that back then, we also interested in looking at high energy electrons that was easier to do in the VMI. And then, of course, we do the usual event by event recording, uh, determine the momenta from the time of flight and the hit positions, and get the full 3D momenta. By doing that, we can also do what's known as Newton plots. So we can take our molecules and, come on, here, yeah, rotate all of them in a way that a reference ion always points to the right. Oops, that was too far. Let's go back here, that a reference ion points to the right and then plot the direction of where we see the other ions. And that gives us more information just at the angle, always gives, also gives us the magnitude of the momenta. And we can see again that for the trans, if the chlorine flies to the, to the right, the other chlorine flies more or less back to back to the left, the C2H2 kind of gets stuck in the middle. If we do the same explosion for the cis, the C2H2 gains a lot more energy because kind of repels off of the two chlorines now. So this is all great and fine. So one of the things we are wondering, can, how far can we actually take this? Can we quantitatively determine the, the uh, abundance of one or the other isomer? Because we want to do this in a time riddled experiment where hopefully things are changing. So at the ALS, we kind of did the first step statically. We used an isomerically mixed sample and it's because it was dibromoethene just because we buy this mixed um, with a, with a well-known ratio um, and um, did the experiment at the bromine initial edge, 140 EV, and again looked at the angle between the two bromines now. Indeed, we see two peaks, which we can fit. One at 180 degree, we can attribute to trans, the other one to cis. We can fit Gaussians to them, and our experiment gives us a, a trans cis ratio of 2.04, the vendor tells us um, when they did the analysis, it was 2.06. So this is indeed a quantitative way of determining the, the isomer ratio. Recently, we wondered if uh, this not only works for geometric isomers, um, but maybe also for more flexible things that can interconvert, namely um, conformers. Now, just uh, because we're an, an Adam heavy uh, crowd here today may be briefly explaining what a conformer is. So they're known as conformational isomers. These are molecules with the same chemical formula, but different geometric structures. So similar to the other isomers. But in this case, there's only a single bond that uh, around which they would have to rotate. Daniel. So, yes. Daniel, you have three minutes, okay? Okay. Thank you. Um, these have all kind of important uh, roles that they play in and biology and so on. But the important thing from, from an experimental point of view is that oftentimes they can interconvert at room temperature because this, the single bond, the rotation around a single bond is pretty easy. And we can calculate, if we know the, the, the enthalpy of these uh, um, products, we can calculate the ratio, but it's difficult to determine and, and quantify and separate these experimentally. So the question is, can we do Coulomb explosion imaging also on conformers? We do a similar trick. We put our anti and gauche. That's the way they're called when they're conformers in here. We can see if we squint these two distributions. We can also plot the Newton plots. And maybe the first thing we see is that um, verse in the, in the isomer case, 
In the geometric isomer case, we had very clear islands we could contribute attribute to cis and trans. In the confirmer case, there's this ugly circle in there that kind of smears things out. And that uh, long story short is, is a well-known feature of a sequential breakup where the, the two bonds that need to break don't break at the same time. So we need to actually disentangle the concerted breakup from the sequential breakup. And fortunately, a couple of years ago, we developed a method that we called native frames method to do this. I don't have time to go into details how we do this, but you can read up this paper here. But the bottom line is it helps us subtract the sequential breakup. And then we have the purely concerted um, parts for the anti and the gauche here. We can do a Coulomb explosion simulation that very much nicely um, confirms our, our um, assignment. And then we can just take the ratio of anti to gauche at a function of nozzle temperature, because we want to see if we see the changing ratio. And indeed, anti goes down, gauche goes up as we expect. And if we plot the, the ratio and compare that to our you know, simple thermo, thermodynamics theory, it agrees very nicely with what we expect. So indeed, we can actually do uh, determine conformer ratios from this Coulomb explosion imaging. Um, just as a very quick outlook, can we do it for more complex molecules? We've tried. Oftentimes, the contribution of sequential breakup is stronger and stronger. It becomes hard to disentangle. Very recently, we did a beautiful experiment at the European XFEL, led by Rebecca Ball and, and Talianke, where we blew up two ring molecules, so really big molecules now, I mean, at least for our AMO, a heavy AMO community. And we can see very nice um, images, momentum images that, that really represent very well the molecular structure of, the, of what we're looking at. So this Coulomb explosion imaging with XFELs works beautifully. Um, even the hydrogen positions which are hard to see with other methods are very nicely resolved. And the next step, of course, is now to do this time resolved. And we have beam time scheduled for May 2021, COVID permitting. So with that, just a quick uh, acknowledgement of the, the first part, the experiment with the Lindell group, Oliver Hammers, Renaud Guimain, Wayne, who is also speaking here, and Dennis Lindell, and then the theory um, by Steve and, and others. And then the second part of the work was uh, work done in my group now from Kansas State University, oftentimes in collaboration with Nora Barris group and uh, some other colleagues. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel. Um, okay, time for some questions, if anyone has them. Okay, I will um, decide. I do not hear anything. Is there any, no chats? Uh, uh, I... <clears throat> go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, very nice work, Daniel. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, have you tried out of, or I do not know whether I missed or not, H2O2? Um, we have not tried H2O2, no. Okay. Because there is some experiments are done in our lab now here uh, using recoil ion spectroscopy, of course, similar technique, but mm -hmm. by heavy ions and H2O2. And uh, I was wondering whether there is some new results from photo ionizations or not. Um, would be happy, you know, Shoot me an email, tell me more about it, and I would be happy to try it. <laughs> yes, sure. I think that has been submitted by my colleagues. I am not involved by for publications, but I'll contact. I'll tell him. To contact. Okay, okay, thanks. I look forward. Thank you. So uh, thanks, Daniel, for a really great presentation. This is Stacy here from Lund. Yeah. Um, and I just had a, a question. So you show these beautiful molecules and these really nice, um, you know, preferential um, channels. And then you have always this uh, bromine or iodine, and this this is not only a source of say, yeah, I mean where you can get this um, extra electrons and that can affect the dissociation. But how much does it really affect the dynamics in the molecules that you would have without this this alkali? Because maybe that's the more interesting question. Right, that's definitely an interesting question, and it's I, I don't have an answer to that yet. Um, we, although we have tried a bunch of different molecules. Um, so maybe the answer is already in the data, but I haven't seen sort of the, the pattern. You know, to me, it's still an, an unexplainable mess 
why some of them break one way and some of them break another way. Some of them have a lot more sequential breakup, some have a lot more concerted breakup. You know, even comparing the geometric isomer and the confirmer, hmm. just this one, this one bond that's different makes a big difference in the fragmentation dynamic. And um, we've, we've tried to do some sort of systematic studies with making things bigger in certain ways. But again, I, I have not seen the pattern that would jump out at me and say, aha, this is yeah. why it, it's sort of like, it seems to every molecule seems to just do what it does. And I don't know, I don't understand why right now, but I agree that would be really interesting to kind of get to the bottom of because um, otherwise it's kind of difficult if it just sort of does random things. No, but it's very complex uh, experiments and very complex um, analysis of these um, many, many different pathways. So fantastic work. And we only get beam time at the ALS twice a year. So it takes a little while to do systematic studies. <laughs> mm. Quick comment on that. It may also depend on the photon energy. Maybe different for lower and higher energies. Sure. Although we have, I mean, absolutely, right? But in this case, we've tried to always be above an inner shell edge where we have a significant amount of triple ionization. So we've tried to sort of as as similar as we can be when we have different elements, um, keep that at least as a as a theme. But yes, it, it will probably depend on the photon energy as well. And I haven't found too many theorists who want to deal with fragmentation. That's another problem. <laughs> Okay, um, I can vouch for that. Uh, let us uh, move on now to our final speaker is Stacy Sorensen from Lund University with the title of the talk of the, uh, title of the talk as resonant inner shell excitation drives nuclear dynamics and cyclopropane. Go ahead, Stacy. Okay, thank you very much. Let's see how this goes. Does everybody see my presentation? Yeah, no, I don't see anybody, but hopefully this is this is good. So thanks very much for inviting me to take part in this. Um, I'm really impressed by the, the breadth of the different presentations today, and it's been really, really interesting. I've been myself, um, I've, I've had very little time to be active in research the last few years, but I'm just finishing up um, a stint uh, as a research administration at our university, and hopefully we'll be able to um, devote a lot more time to, to research in the coming years. So I wanted to, to tell something about a project that's been not exactly lying around, but it started off um, probably four years ago with a previous PhD student. We're looking not at an atom, not at a diatomic molecule, but you could say at least we're looking at the simplest cyclic hydrocarbon. So C3H6, we have a triangle of, of carbons and then each of the carbons is bonded to two hydrogen. So it's a very cute molecule. Um, and the experiments were done in Lund, Sweden. And this is a photo of the MAX4 um, synchrotron light source. And you can see in the background, not only the moon, but also the European spallation source for neutron spallation that's being built um, as the neighbor of MAX4. And MAX4 was inaugurated a couple of years ago, but the, the low density matter beam lines uh, were, are mainly on the small ring at max and that ring started up yeah say roughly about two years ago so just a little bit of advertising for max 4 there are presently say five beam lines for low density matter experiments um, and they're all uh, in the say soft x-ray range except for the femtomax beam line which is um, similar to the the short pulse light source that was at um, Stanford before. So it delivers about 100 femtosecond uh, pulses in the range of uh, say 2 to 20 kilovolts. And these are slowly coming online and you can see what techniques we offer there. And the main, uh, I think, interesting system for the experiments that I'll be presenting today is the new ICE spectrometer. Um, 
and it's uh, yeah, ion coincidences with electrons. And it's a system which is quite similar to, to what Daniel was using. And, and even I think Wayne presented quite a good introduction to mass spectrometry in general. So that was helpful to me. So the ice spectrometer is built by Rantec and we have a molecular jet and a cluster source. And there's also a, a liquid jet for this system. But there's also a separate end station with a Sienta electron spectrometer. And how do I know Steve? Well, I've listened to Steve at a lot of conferences. I've met him at quite a few conferences, but it's been a while. Um, I think I remember once we discussed um, some measurements that Arnaldo Navis de Brito and I had done on, on um, argon looking at the partial cross sections for different valence states. But Steve said he wasn't really that interested in calculating these. There were just too many electrons in that system. So maybe that's uh, kind of along the line of what we heard from Maria Novella, but um, we could also say that, uh, yeah, we, um, we look at molecules, but of course every molecule needs at least two atoms. So I'm gonna be presenting uh, some work on psychopropane, which is a small molecule, and we're looking at core excited states. And here the idea is really um, do electronic states of different symmetry and perhaps different geometry um, influence the sequence of fragmentation steps? And we can use the core excitation in order to choose particular states. Um, and the measurements that we're doing is after uh, x-rays are used to excite the, the core electrons to different valence states, then we measure multi-ion fragment imaging. So we measure electrons in coincidence with the ions. We can measure the ions momentum as well as I think partly, partly what uh, Daniel was showing. And we can also um, really look at these angular um, differences. So angular emission of different fragments. And we can also try to look at the dynamics of these fragments in order to zero in on, on particular um, uh, situations. But here I'll just be showing some, some rather straightforward, just uh, electron ion ion coincidences. And if we look at cyclopropane at the carbon one S edge, uh, this, this spectrum was measured first by Hitchcock um, using IS eels. And then uh, after was, was remeasured at a little bit higher resolutions by uh, C and Brion, so that was a while ago. But uh, so the states here are fairly well known. Uh, the symmetries are fairly well known and there have even been calculations partly done uh, by, by Hitchcock in that original study. But the reason that we were looking at this is that we have um, three different states we can excite to. And the, the first one is uh, this completely symmetric, um, these A1 uh, type of, of orbitals. And uh, there the idea is that we seem to, to excite uh, these out of plane molecular orbitals. So we keep the, the carbon uh, backbone, if you wanna call it that, the, the triangle intact and the hydrogens are moving. And then for the second um, resonance, the, the 1A2 prime, um, then we have a, a planar molecular orbital and it seems as though the, the um, carbon, yeah, yeah, um, if you want to call it ring, um, it, it, it expands. So it's kind of like a breathing mode, but you can see from the way that the, the molecular orbitals look that this is an anti-bonding carbon, carbon orbital. And then finally, we have a, one orbital of uh, E symmetry. And this in, in these highly symmetric uh, molecules, the, these type of orbitals will be affected by, by Jan Teller splitting. Um, and so then we can really look at how does the, the shape of the molecule really change when we ionize one of these, these electrons. But in this case, now we're populating these orbitals. Uh, so it's not exactly the same as, as photoionization, but um, I think that the, the, the question is whether these same ideas will hold. And so in this case for the Jan Teller distortions, um, if we start off in, in the ground state, which is D3H uh, symmetry, then we have three carbon-carbon bonds that are equal. But as soon as we ionize an electron which has this E prime symmetry, then we can either move to, to the one case, which is um, where we elongate two of the bonds um, or the other case where we yeah, elongate one of the bonds. And, and then we um, get a splitting and the order between the, the states and energy can be slightly different. 
And I think these things are fairly well known. Uh, cyclopropane, it's been studied for many, many years. Uh, here's an electron spectrum angle resolve measured by Holland, where he really showed that in the outer valence, we get this clear speeding for the E states. And uh, there have been also a number of calculations among them, uh, this one by Zoe and Kramer. Um, so this is just um, showing quickly what uh, the Hitchcock uh, measurements showed, um, looking at these different cyclic hydrocarbons, um, that there are two main covalence features. And then in the continuum, there were also uh, what he called then shape resonances. Um, and these were characterized fairly well. And if you look in detail at the lower resonance states, um, then we have um, three separate states um, that we could identify. There could be more. But these, um, this is a calculation that was done by uh, Duflo in 2006. And the red line here is um, the calculation of these electronic states, including the vibrations. The blue line is, is say, the that um, spectrum convoluted. Uh, and this purple line is actually our recent measurement of um, the X-ray absorption spectrum. And it actually matches extremely well to their calculation. So here then we wanted to look at, at these states and at these states and by looking at these um, vibrational structure, then we can also confirm um, these the original ideas. So for the 1A2, we see really the mainly the C ring expansion mode. And Duflo also calculated that the molecule um, should go from this triangular shape into to this um, yeah, elongated shape. And then there can be a number of different um, dynamic steps that take place after that. And this idea is actually something that um, Gadea uh, sort of threw out in a very short paper that was written in 1997 about um, nuclear dynamics in the core excited states. And cyclopropane was one of the examples that he showed and uh, that ending up in this amino ethyl radical uh, geometry um, is, is pretty much exactly what we see. Um, just as an aside, we also measured the XPS spectrum because we also see the vibrational structure in the Rydberg states matches that quite well. And it turned out that um, calculations have been done and even measurements have been earlier, but the last ones were done in, in about 1970 and the, the um, value that was published then is not far away, but actually the, our recent measurement is about um, yeah, 290.35. So it's about uh, 300 milli electron volts uh, lower than the previous value. And this can, can affect uh, some of the assignments of these states a bit, but it doesn't affect this study. So then the idea here is that we should excite at these different states um, here at this 2A2 prime here at this 1A and then here at one of the continuum states. And we want to really just look at um, what, what's happening in the geometry of this molecule in order to investigate what the role of the molecular geometry is in the core excited state. And we do that by looking at fragmentation. And our setup is um, rather straightforward. Uh, we have an electron spectrometer, an electron detector with position sensitivity here and an ion spectrometer. And the way that it's designed, we can accurately measure the momentum and we have very high transmission uh, for all of these different fragments. So the way that the measurements look um, is something like this. So we measure two ions or more in coincidence with each other. And here I've just chosen a, a subset of the ones. So here we could look at, for example, C2H3 ion in coincidence with CH3 ion. And so these, um, that means that the dication state of, of cyclopropane has dissociated into two pieces without losing any other hydrogens. So here is what the ground state of this looks like. Doubly ionized states are populated through the core excitation, so, so through the decay of the core excited state. And then uh, we have different fragmentation channels. So this is really just to show what it is that we measure. We measure the intensity of these. We can also look at the shape of this and get some information about the kinetic energy release. And if we do a more detailed um, analysis, we can get out all the dynamics. Um, so- AC, uh, you have three minutes, okay? Okay. 
And so the measurement um, that we do for each of these energies, we measure all of these different fragments. And so very briefly, we can either look at the ring opening and that populates say, we could use one state or one pair as the indicator of that for the ring closing, we could see another channel, which is an indicator. And then we have this, this third um, case uh, where we can also look at one of these channels. And if we look at the branching ratios for different families, so here C plus C2 and, um, oops, and here CH2 plus C2, and then here where we have the ring intact, we see that indeed we have certain channels which are suppressed for certain resonances or that reach a maximum for others. And, and so we can see that these particular channels seem to be indicators of these, uh, the geometry of the core excited states. And this um, can be explained by looking at really what happens when you populate the doubly ionized states. You can either go in the direction of two carbon-carbon bond el elongation or the direction of one carbon-carbon bond elongation. And then we can populate um, different states that dissociate giving us different pairs. So we think that we can really see a preferential dissociation based upon uh, the symmetry and the geometry of the core excited states. And they seem to roughly correlate with the geometry, um, but there are lots of processes that can influence the outcome. For example, these different transition states that were actually calculated for propene, but that's the kind of geometry that we can end up in after um, one of these different core excited states. So, um, with so little time left, I'd like to first just acknowledge my um, PhD students and the other people in my group in Lund and the people that um, have been working on the Beamline and to Steve Manson for contributing to the field for more than 50 years. Thanks very much. Thank you, Stacy. Um, please, anyone go ahead with uh, questions you might have. Uh, Dan. Yeah. Stacey, very nice talk. Seems to match uh, very well with what I was uh, ending up with. So I have a question for you too, and maybe I think it was just too fast. Uh, could you throw up the slide okay. again? When you were explaining why you saw that certain things were from a ring open state. I, I think I didn't catch it fast enough. Yeah, I think I took about three seconds on that slide. So let's see if I can get it back. Um, I know it was because our chairman interrupted you, so I'm giving you a chance to spend more than three <laughs> seconds on it. <laughs> Great. Well, is this the slide that you meant? I think so, yes, it's one of them, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so here we show um, if we, this is one of the, say, many possible dications, dication states that can be populated uh, through decay of the core excited state. And we say we start off here. And there are several different states and we follow basically the minimum reaction pathway here. And so this is showing really the calculation of the different um, possible pathways. And so if we have the one case with two carbon-carbon bond elongation, so basically coming from this Jan Teller um, distortion, then we move along say this path and we end up to, to a state which really dissociates giving these two um, ions. And if instead there's, uh, we end up in the state with the one carbon-carbon bond elongated, then we move here, but then we need to also overcome this barrier. And that's where we would then see this kinetic energy release, which you actually do see in the fragments, but, but I don't show that, that data in this presentation. Okay, thank you. Thanks for your question. Any other questions? Okay, that, um, that uh, I, I want to thank all the speakers for agreeing to um, participate and also all the attendees. Uh, this is a real nice turnout here, I think. Uh, this ses speaker session is officially over, but I, at this point, I'll just ask if Pranal or Steve, you have anything else to say or otherwise I'll feel free to sign out. Steve? Um, well, uh, I am overwhelmed and flattered 
and humbled. And I don't do humble very well, but um, uh, it certainly is uh, an impressive array of physics. And I am delighted to have some small part in some of it, and some of it many, many years ago. Uh, like I say, it's what's being done now is amazing compared to what we could do years ago. And I'll leave it at that. Are there any other comments from anyone in general here? I take that as a no, so let us conclude here. I'll just keep the, well, the text will keep the window open for a bit, but um, same time, well, same time, no, <laughs> same time. To me. Go ahead, someone had a comment? Yeah, the next session is coming up uh, uh, in less than 12 hours. Um, that's because of this uh, crazy timetable we have to accommodate uh, people from all over the globe. And it's, uh, it's impossible to have it convenient for everybody. And especially the second session is going to be very hard um, for almost everybody in the US, including Steve. And I'm really very sorry for it, Steve. It's your birthday, which you are celebrating. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to take a nap this afternoon so I can stay awake. <laughs> yeah, please do that. <laughs> so, so other than that, I think we are uh, pretty much uh, ready to wrap up. So uh, Tom, maybe you can just conclude the session and uh, we can uh, sign out. Okay, I'll, I'll say that I too have worked with Steve a lot and it's been a lot of fun as I said on his birthday message, you know, 90% talking about anything and everything but atomic physics, but getting a lot of work done. It's been very enjoyable. So that's my final comment. There are two chats here I just noticed now. Uh, well, paper. <laughs> Those are probably, okay, very good. So um, I'll say that uh, we're done here and I'll be the first to leave. Thank you, everyone, okay, peace. Hey, Tom, thanks for keeping the sessions you know, on time. Thanks. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, it certainly was a very wonderful session, Tom. Thank you very much. Right, well done. exactly. Okay, goodbye, everybody. Bye-bye. See you, bye. 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 Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Yeah, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Take care. So, Prana. Oh. Yes. Bye-bye. Okay. So, what Bye, time? Prana. See you. Yes, Alfred. See you soon. Mm. Uh, See you soon. Bye-bye. Yes. Horst had some difficulty signing in, but I'm glad he was in. So I think there were one or two who had some difficulty signing into the session, but finally, I think they made it. Our technical, our technical team was able to help them out. So, uh, what time you say the next session going to start? You say well, uh, it will be Indian time, nine thirty Tuesday morning. Oh, okay. Tuesday. Early morning. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, on the U.S. It's East Coast, 100. it will be, yeah, on the U.S. East Coast, it begins at 11 o'clock mm. in, the, in the late evening, so it's, yeah, yeah. it's really hard. All right. You know, it, went, it went very well, uh, Prana. Yes, I think it yeah. has been a wonderful session. Yeah, very nice, also nice yes. to see somebody. Yes. Um, Yes. Yeah. Yes, same here. It yeah. was a very nice session. Thank you, Ravi. Okay. <clears throat> See you at See night you. for me. Yes. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Yes. Hey, Ravi. Yeah. How are you? Hi, Alfred. Good to see How you. How are you doing? It's been a long time. <laughs> it's a long time. I wanted to say something to you. You still look yes. you still look smart.